In this video, we're going to discuss the Bohr model of the atom. So at this point, we've discussed some failures of classical mechanics and what was learned from those failures of classical mechanics. But now the question is, how did we take what we learned from those experimental failures of classical mechanics and apply it to a better model of the atom, right? So that's where the Bohr model comes in. So this was an, an early atomic model that was developed by a Danish physicist named Niels Bohr in the early 1900s. And he was really considered one of the, the early pioneers of quantum mechanics and especially quantum chemistry, how quantum mechanics is applied in a chemical context. So what he was able to do was to build an effective model for the energy of an electron in, a hydrogen, in the hydrogen atom. So basically his model looks something like this, where you have a nucleus um, that has some charge, some positive charge, and an electron that orbits around the nucleus. And I know you're probably thinking, wait a second, in the beginning of this unit, you told us that this would result in the electron death spiral, right? The electron would emit electromagnetic radiation and it would get closer and closer to the nucleus until it finally caves in. That's true. But Bohr made a few key um, assumptions in his model that prevented the death spiral and gave accurate energies for an electron in a hydrogen atom. So let's take a look at how Bohr was thinking through this uh, physical model. So first we want an energy for this electron, right? And we know that the total energy is gonna be equal to the kinetic energy contribution plus the potential energy contribution. Right. So that's just general, you know, general for any particle. Its energy is going to be a sum of its kinetic and potential contributions. Now, for the kinetic energy, we know that that's going to be just as it is for any traveling particle. That's going to be one half mv squared. Right. So we'll have one half mv squared for the kinetic energy. Now, the potential energy uh, is going to come from the Coulombic attraction between these two oppositely charged particles. Right. The positively charged nuclei and the negatively charged electron. And that's going to be a ratio of the two charges, right? So you'll have the positive charge Z from the nucleus and E for the uh, E squared for the electron charge, right? So Z is the nucleus charge and E is the electron charge. And that's going to be over the distance between them. So this R is just going to be the distance between the nuclei and the electron. Right. So this is R. Right. So we know that this is the kinetic. This is going to give us the total energy for our electron. So the first assumption that Bohr makes here is regarding what we talked about in one of the previous videos, this idea of the centrifugal force. So what Bohr um, assumed here, right, I'm going to actually get rid of this R. You know that R is the distance between those two. So we know that there's going to be a Coulombic force a Coulombic attraction between these two charged particles, right? Um, that's going to, to attract them together, right? That's what would lead to the electron death spiral. What Bohr assumed is that the centrifugal force is actually going to be equal to this Coulombic force, right? So you will have a centrifugal force that's going to be exactly equal to the Coulombic force, right? So let me uh, highlight this as the first assumption. Right, this first assumption is that the Coulombic force is going to be equal to the centrifugal force. Okay, well, if we do that, right, we can set these two forces equal. So the Coulombic force is going to be, and let me just write this actually off to the side somewhere here. So the Coulombic force is going to be Z times E squared over R squared. That's the Coulombic force. And then the centrifugal force is going to be equal to negative mv squared over r. Right, so we have the Coulombic force and the centrifugal force. We can set these two equal, and there should be a negative sign here as well. So the Coulombic force is negative ze squared over r squared. Centrifugal force is negative mv squared 
over R. So now we can set those two equal in the Bohr model, right? This is the first assumption. So the uh, Coulombic force, ZE squared over R squared is equal to MV squared over R. I went ahead and dropped both of the negatives since both of those expressions are negative. So if we solve this for MV squared, if we algebraically isolate MV squared, we end up with ZE squared over R. Right, so basically all we do is multiply by r on both sides that isolates mv squared so you get this um, expression for mv squared what we can do is then plug this expression back into our energy expression in order to get these in in like terms right so doing that right so if we plug that guy in we get e is equal to one half ze squared over r minus ZE squared over R. And so that's going to leave us with an energy expression of negative ZE squared over 2R, right? Because you have one half here. Um, this is basically one. So you get a negative ZE squared over R. Okay. So we're not actually done yet because it turns out that just doing this doesn't solve your electron death spiral problem because this can't be defined exactly for every single point in space. So, um, so Bohr took a cue from Planck's law where we saw that energy was quantized in these discrete whole number integer pockets, right? He's going to assume something very similar here as well. Let's take the definition of the radius for the Bohr model. So in the Bohr model, the radius is going to be equal to L, which L is the angular momentum of this electron, right? So any, um, any particle traveling in a circular motion is going to have an angular momentum. So that angular momentum is going to be L squared over mz e squared. This is the Bohr radius, right? So this is the radius of the electron in the, or the radius of this electron's path in the Bohr model. Now, the second assumption here that Bohr made is that this angular momentum, right? So let me actually label this guy as angular momentum. His second assumption is that the angular momentum can be quantized, right? Just like the energy in Planck's law, he assumed that the angular momentum can be, can be quantized in a similar way. And so he assumed that the angular momentum is going to be equal to NH, where H is still Planck's constant, over 2 pi. And so this is the second assumption. This is known as the quantum hypothesis. The quantum hypothesis. Right. So the quantum hypothesis tells us that the angular momentum can be quantized in this way. Right. Where n is just any integer. Right. Just like in Planck's law. This is any integer. One, two, three, on and on and on. Right. So plugging that guy back in, we get a radius. That is equal to n squared. H squared. Over four pi squared. M z e squared right so now we have the radius being quantized in a very similar way right so what we can do here we have this expression for the radius so what i'm going to do is plug this guy back into our energy expression here right plug this in for r so if i do that right we have e is equal to uh negative 2 pi squared m e to the fourth over h squared times z squared over n squared. And I've, I've kind of separated this term for a reason. If you look at this, right, everything that's in this fraction out front, this is all constant, right? Two is just a number. Pi is a constant. The mass of an electron doesn't change. The charge on an electron doesn't change. Those are constants. H is Planck's constant. All of this stuff out front is a constant. So we can just write this as a number, right? So we have E is just going to be equal to negative 2.178 
times 10 to the negative 18 joules times z squared over n squared. Right, so this is going to be the equation for the energy of an electron in the Bohr model, right? The only thing that's changing here is potentially the charge on your atom, right? If you're dealing with hydrogen or if you're dealing with nitrogen, those are gonna be two different charges, right? Um, and N, which is just the quantized energy, right? This integer N, one, two, three, four, on and on and on, right? Now, what does this mean for our model? Right. So thinking about the fact that that the angular momentum is quantized in this way in discrete countable um, integers in. Right. Let's kind of draw out what this will look like for our for our Bohr model. Right. So, again, going to put our nucleus here. Right. What this means is that, you know, the electron can't just exist in any point in space out with respect to the the nuclei right it has to exist in these discrete countable angular momenta right so let's say for example this is where uh the uh, angular momentum where n is equal to one right then you'll have to have another one where n is equal to two right another one where n is equal to three Right. And you can keep doing this on and on and on for higher and higher integers. Right. This is what this is telling us is that the electron can't just exist in any point in space relative to the nuclei. It has to exist in these discrete pockets. It has to either be in the n equals one um, radius. Right. Or it has to be in n equals two or n equals three and on and on and on. Right. It has to exist in these discrete countable uh, pockets of angular momenta that were quantized in the Bohr model, right? So kind of going back to this equation, this is what the equation is telling us. It's telling us that, you know, this electron can't just exist anywhere, right? Has to be at these countable points in space, n equals one, n equals two, on and on and on. Okay, so that's a, a quick derivation of the Bohr model. There are a few details that I skipped here. Um, you can find some derivations online if you want to know, like, how, what, you know, what's the definition of the angular momentum, uh, more about this quantum hypothesis. There are some more detailed derivations online, but I think this is kind of the, the quick and dirty that gives you all of the physical underpinnings that you need to understand and help you understand this equation on a physical level without getting a little bit too lost in the weeds. So that's, that was my point here. Um, so hopefully I achieve that. But if you want more detail, there are some pretty good detailed derivations online for you to, to find more information.